morning. Uh, I'm Dr. Jim Klingler. I'm the uh, academic advisor for the uh, Innovation, Creativity, and Entrepreneurship Strategic Interest Group. Boy, what a mouthful that is here in the Villanova School of Business. But I am also deeply involved in entrepreneurship education here at the university. Probably no tool has ever come down the pike that has facilitated entrepreneurship more than the World Wide Web. Uh, today we're going to listen to a, a presentation uh, by some people who are uh, in the midst of, in the fog of perhaps, uh, a new startup in this uh, using the web. And we're also going to hear from uh, a representative of a company that has uh, managed to get through the fog to the concept proven stage and is really uh, a dynamic company. So first I'm going to introduce John Wagner from eMoney e and uh, we'll get started. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Um, I want to thank that. Will, you're back there, Will. I'm glad I can recognize you. Great presentation this morning. I'm um, actually going to probably follow up from a lot of the points you already had. Um, first, let's do some introductions. My name is John Wagner. I'm the Senior Vice President and Chief Architect for eMoney Advisor. Uh, eMoney is uh, a web-based company, our product is 100% web-based, and it's a wealth management system for financial advisors and their clients to collaborate um, on uh, all the client's wealth. So we integrate uh, data feeds from all different places and clients can see where their money is and where their assets are and we do financial plans and facilitate um, the collaboration between advisors and their clients. I've been with eMoney for about eight years. We started in, uh, in 2000, uh, right when the dot-com uh, bust happened. Somehow we managed through it. Um, we're a very successful company now. We're cash flow positive. Um, so that's the successful part, at least I can bring to the table. Um, before that, I worked at uh, Vertical Net back in the old dot-com days. I was there for a couple years. So they were incredibly successful for a couple years during the dot-com boom and incredibly unsuccessful shortly thereafter. So I can share a lot about that also. Um, and before that, I worked for Reuters uh, developing their initial web presence for, for finance. Um, so that's sort of my background. I have a, a lot of experience I can share with you today. Uh, these two guys are uh, Jake uh, Klinbeck, Klinbeck? I forget, and, uh, and Dan Kerbeck from Presentation. Let me talk a little bit about, you, about, uh, about yourself here. Uh, my name is Jake Klinvex, one of the co-founders of Presentation. I'm also a senior here at Villanova. Um, Dan and I founded the company uh, a little over, I guess, a year and a half or two years ago. And what we focus on is video communications between uh, professionals. Uh, we're focusing a lot on the financial services firms right now. Uh, so we're still in the uh, concept proving and the fog, as Dr. Klinger likes to call it. Um, but it's been a really great experience, and we'd love to just share what's been happening with us, and I'll let Dan. Sure. That's it. Uh, I'm Dan Kerbick, also a senior from Long Island, the co-founder of Presentation, which you can see started now there. All right. Um, when we talk about the, uh, the industry challenges of doing anything on the web these days, um, it's different from anything else because your product is just out there. It doesn't exist. I have a product. You can't see it. I can't really bring it with me, but it's on the Internet. Um, as Will mentioned before, the pace of change here is incredible. Um, you wake up next week, there's a new technology or a new idea, or the thing you did this week is gone. No one wants to look at it anymore. There's a very low barrier to entry. There's two people in a garage or one guy with a notebook can start a whole new business and they can compete with you. That's a good thing and a bad thing. The other bad thing about um, uh, web-based companies is that if you build something on the web, there's this whole perception these days that everything on the web is, should be free, just like TV. It should be free. I shouldn't have to pay for it. So it's really, really hard to get started um, in a business like this. Um, fortunately, one of the things that we can actually talk about is we have all the answers on, that you need on the next slide. And the real answer is it depends. I can't, you know, I would like to give you some advice here. Um, unfortunately, there's no hard and fast rule. This is, this is software because it's flexible. It's going to change very, very quickly. So rather than giving everybody some you know, hard and fast rules, we're going to talk a lot about of our experiences. So I'll give you a lot of experiences that, that, we've, that I've gone through with our companies, um, and these guys will talk about the decisions they've made. So we talk about things that we know are successful and things that we hope are successful. And um, that's sort of what we wanted to do with this presentation. Um, so feel free to ask questions as we go along. We're also going to reserve some time at the end, um, so hopefully we'll get in some sort of a dialogue behind that. Okay. Um, I think if we start off, the number one thing in any company, not just a web-based company, but I think particularly in a software company, is the people. And this sort of follows up from Will's comments this morning. You have to have somebody, and everyone, actually everyone in your company has to understand the vision. What are you going to be when you grow up? 
and they have to have the energy to share that with everybody else because everybody in the company, from the CEO, if you're in the technology company, down to the development staff, the support staff, the secretary, anyone that communicates with clients, has to really understand what's going on because everything they do every day is going, it makes it a decision. If your programmer writes a line of code, they're making a decision as to what that product should be. And so you actually have to have, a, the most important part is being able to, sh to, to share that with every person in the company and infuse that in your culture. And, and you know, one of, the, one of the things I liked about Will's presentation this morning was that when he talks about having an A team and the culture and everyone buying in, that is 100% correct. The teams that I've always worked on, everybody's in it for the entire team. And we're always making decisions to make the product better and the company better. And that's the number one thing because you're going to have some hard times. You, we, you know, we made it through the dot-com boom and the dot-com bust, and we started a new company. Um, and that's mostly there because we're flexible around things, and our culture is a culture of success. Um, now, you guys started out um, just a couple years ago. How, 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 we're going to talk about a little bit about how you guys fit together and what you're looking for when you're, you know, as you're, as you're you know, sort of expanding. I guess as we expand, we're in a little bit of a different situation because we outsourced our uh, development, which we'll get into later. But a lot of this stuff holds true with the really the vision and the um, energy, as John talked about. I mean, right now we currently have about five employees, so it's kind of hard to talk on this stuff right now because we all kind of do the same thing right now and just stay up late and work hard. But um, as we get more into the actual vendors, I'll be able to uh, communicate with that more. More talk. So, if you have a team in place, probably the, the second most important decision anything you do in, in a web-based company is the product you're going to build. I've seen so many companies fail in the space because they don't add value. Um, I was working with uh, a couple friends of mine that were looking into a social networking startup, and uh, their, their one brilliant idea they had one day, and it was, of course, at a very large site, uh, was let's build blogs for sports teams' fans. So, you know, we'll go, and so that's great. People will go blog. And I said, well, how are you going to get people to go there? And they said, you don't need to. They're fans. They'll just go, and they'll show up. Sort of like if you build it, they will come. In this case, they were, weren't adding any value. That stuff's already out there. If you're not, if you have, a, if you're going to build a business, you're an entrepreneur. You have to have, you have to add value to whoever your customers are. If you're not adding value, you're not going to make any money. There's plenty of things you can do out there for a hobby, and you know that's great. You'll learn to get a lot of experience out of it. But if you want to build a business out of it, you're going to have to add value um, somewhere. And when you understand the value proposition you're going to make, that filters into the core values that you have and the differentiator. So make sure you understand what do you do that's going to be better than anybody else. Where is your point of excellence? And how are you going to keep that different from everyone else? And that actually goes through all the decisions you're going to make down the line. And we'll probably phase in a lot to um, a little more into the, the technology decisions that you'll make. But you have to understand what is important to you and what's not important to you. One of the early examples um, when eMoney first started, um, we started doing uh, collaborations between their financial advisors and their clients. And one of the ways we wanted to get paid was to get a portion of their commission, which would be nice because they make more money, we make more money. Um, but the tools that we had in place in terms of financial planning didn't really sync up with their value proposition. So they, you know, they're, making, they're advising their clients and they're getting paid a commission on their assets under management um, and for advisory fees. But the tools that we had in place didn't sync up with that. So we couldn't make any money because we, we – we weren't able to um, provide them value that then they could see the value on. Eventually, we ended up changing our business model, and we just went through with a flat fee licensing model, and they could understand that and put that in sort of their, their back-end cost structure. So that's something that we were able to do early on in our marketplace and, and, and sort of tune what our value propositions are and what we want to be good at um, actually changed over time. I know you guys went through that process early on, even before I met you. Right. I mean, if you look at what our pro product began as, and what it is now, they're almost completely different. And it's very interesting because the differentiation that John mentioned is absolutely crucial. I mean, being in the space of Internet video, Internet video is ubiquitous from uh, YouTube to ESPN.com to CNN. It's everywhere. And being able to differentiate ourselves and convince people to pay money for our services is very challenging. But what we've done is branded ourselves as professional Internet video and really stressed our ease of use. You know, 
a product that the average person with limited computer skills can create and remain uh, in, a, in a professional setting, you know, because one of our lines is always, you know, you can use YouTube, but then your, your sales pitch or your, your business communication is right up there next to Britney Spears and, like, dogs on skateboards. So it's been uh, very interesting to be to convince people to uh, not take the route of uh, of using free internet video on YouTube and, and and use our tool instead. And I think that's really flowed through um, a lot of your product decisions because once they realized they wanted to be um, professional internet video, if you look at the features they started building and the and what makes you different from everyone else is the workflow around it and the management around this commu internet communication. Whereas if you do a video on YouTube, you never see, you never know who opened it, you never, you know, you can't really monitor and track it over time. But here they're putting those ca that campaign management function in. And that's where they add their value. That's where they're going to make their money. They're going to go from the free service that everyone has, and they can wrap that in, in something that uh, is more valuable to the users. And that's where, and that's where you, can, you can sort of defend your position over time. So obviously we have a product we want to build. One of the things, and, when you get, and this is why we're talking about sort of software and technology here, one of the business, biggest decisions you will ever make, in, and you'll may probably make it every week when you're in a technology space, um, is whether or not you buy something or build it. Because there's a lot of off-the-shelf things you can get, and you can reuse them, or you can build it. And you, you know, it's, it's, so, it's software. They're just bits. You can put them together any way you want. I give everybody this, this advice. Always build the stuff that your core value proposition. Because if you're, if you're going to lease something from somebody else and it's your core value proposition, it puts you in a really, really bad position. You have no control over it. Your, it, your rates can change. You don't really have control over the development cycle. Um, in our experience back at Imani, when we first started the company, we thought it would be a great idea to pull in all, everybody, all the clients' um, accounts, investment accounts from different places, from their banking accounts. We pulled them all into one place. We actually um, outsourced that to, uh, there was like two or three vendors at that time. Um, we outsourced it, so we actually integrated with a third-party provider for this functionality. We used it for a couple years, and it was very, very important. It was, it was uh, one of the best value propositions we could offer to our advisors is have all your clients' information in one place, but we leased it from someone. That company went out of business when we were about two or three years old. So what did we do? We actually had to replace them. So we had to go to a different company, and there was two, there's two providers left. So we went to the second company, we moved all the data over, and you know, we, we were pretty stable with that. And that was probably about 2003. Five years go by, and we have 10 times as much data and 10 times as much clients on this outsourced uh, component of our system that's important. It's whenever people talk to us, it's one of the things that we sell. It's probably our number one or number two value proposition, but it's been outsourced. Um, well, right now, we have to negotiate contracts, but I'm not, not in a great position because they haven't served us, serviced us very well, so we haven't gotten new features. Um, they haven't operated the system very effectively, and they might raise our prices in order to fix that. So now I have a, a, a trade-off. So fortunately, we realized this about two years ago, and we sort of started putting in contingency plans so that we can basically insource that. So we now have the ability to take that functionality, we build it ourselves, and we can manage it. Because it's so important to us core, we don't want to take that risk and, 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 and let that be outside. On the flip side of that, always buy things that aren't towards you. If it's off the shelf, try to buy it. If you're a carpenter, you don't make your own hammer. You go to Home Depot, you go buy a hammer for four bucks and you use it. It's the same thing in the software business. If there's a tool out there, particularly if when, you know, when you have development staff in-house, make sure that they use stuff that's already prefab and their components. You don't want to waste your time building things that aren't for you and building support systems. So make sure that you spend the time on, on what's most important to you. Um, the stuff you do build, you now have the next decision. Do I build a team in-house or do I outsource it? Um, I'm a tech guy, so I like to build things and I like to build it myself. So that's always a decision that I make. Um, but really it comes down to a decision between can, do you have the talent in, in your company, and again it depends, do you have the talent in your company and staff in your company that can manage it? Or is it something that you don't have the staff and you have to, and you have to outsource it? Um, I always break it down into two things. If I can write down on a piece of paper and say this is what I want, then I can go hand it to somebody and they'll build me what I want. That's the decision you want to make. If you can build it, you usually can do it cheaper. And I think that's what, um, you, know, you, you, you guys went through that decision, and it's probably something that you can talk about more than I, more than I can um, Sorry about that. in terms of development of your product. Right. Um, so I, this is for the students here, I guess, how many of you that are thinking of starting a web-based company have programming 
skills that can write code. Or friends. Or friends <laughs> that can write code. Okay, so there are a few people here. I guess Dan and I came into the situation where we were both, I was a finance guy, he's economics. So we really had no idea what we were doing. So we were in a little bit of a different situation where we were forced to outsource. So we actually thought about uh, picking up like coding for dummies or trying to trying to do it somehow ourselves, but that would have been an absolute disaster if we would have uh, went through with it. So fortunately, um, we actually met Cosm here. He's actually my design or my developer over here, and he was able to become our technology arm for us. So we were able to mock things up in Word, uh, m just mock up different things, and he'd be able to, to take care of all that. So that's where I think there are people over here who, I guess you guys are more business and students. I mean, if you're able to find someone like that or find a student that's able to take care of it for you, I would really uh, recommend that. And then in the long term, we might look into uh, building things more internally, but um, right now it is a more cost-effective option to outsource, but make sure that the person that you are outsourcing to is flexible to changing things. As John said, um, there are a lot of developers out there that if you write something that's wrong, they're not going to go back and change and it's going to cost you in the future. And for you guys that do know how to build, I wish I could do that. So. Um, <laughs> But that's, that's where we were on that. But I would say that most people who have a business-centered thing, you're probably going to have to outsource in the beginning just because mm -hmm. of the necessity of funds. Yeah, and building your own development staff is quite expensive. I mean, technology talent can get expensive, and um, you do need support. You need, you need a lot of different talents that usually don't come in one person, so you usually need four or five people to really finish a project. But if you, do, if you are able to outsource it, then basically you, you, know, you cut down on a lot of your expenses um, in order to do that because – they can give you a fraction of people. The big trade-off, though, is that if you're outsourcing it, you're trusting someone else to build it and build what you want. So you either have to find someone that you can explain it to very clearly or find someone who can interpret for you, and that's actually pretty rare. I think these guys have been very lucky in that your, your team has been able to uh, interpret a lot of the requirements and have suggestions that come back. A lot of outsourcing shops will build you exactly what you ask for, and that might not be the product that you want to build. Um, if you have a very complicated project and you, or you want to, um, you have to go through what I say, an iterative design where you want to build something and then see if you like it and then keep tweaking it, and that's a lot of what a lot of software is about. I do recommend trying to bring that in house a lot or hiring a contract developer or whatever because the closer those people are to you, the faster you can go, you can go because you can you can ask for something, get your changes, maybe stand behind the guy while they're coding, and um, and get that back and forth. So. Those are one of the biggest biggest trade-offs you're going to have is, is, is deciding what to do with that. A um, couple of slides here. Most, we used to have big wars about do you, which platform do you use? Do you want to use a Microsoft platform, a Java platform? Bottom line is, it doesn't matter. It all comes down to what your team is. So if you have an in-house team or you have experience behind that, um, that's really what you need to go with. Uh, the teams that I've always worked with have always been a Microsoft shop. We're very, very effective with, with it. We can, we can build very quickly. Um, I know uh, your development stuff shop is um, J2EE. You can get the same functionality out of it, so it really comes down to experience. Um, one big thing, though, you really can't switch. So if you're going to go build a company on one platform, you're probably not going to throw it away and switch to another one. You're probably not going to be able to switch your staff. Um, it's very, very hard to transition between the two. It's just, just an experience thing. You'll lose a lot of, a lot of speed on it. Um, one of the big things that's out there is open source. Hey, I can get free software out there on the internet, and there's the code, you can just download it. Um, other than the, the uh, intellectual property um, rules around that, it's really only free if your time is free, because the source is out there, but it's not supported. You have no tech support, unless you pay someone to do that. So it's really not a free thing. Um, I think you guys have really lucked out. If you look at the, their functionality um, in, in their software, where you can upload basically a video in any format, and you'll get a flash video. That's basically how it works. That module is out there. That's that's open source. It's out there. It's actually pretty well supported. And they've got a core component of their system for free. They basically download it. They don't have to pay for it. It doesn't really seem very much like capitalism to me. But, <laughs> um, but, again, but again, what they've added is value around that. It's almost as if the video processing is a comp is you know it's it's a commodity. Everybody does it now. Every website is able to do that. And 
I could throw that throw a site up on this weekend with the same module and put video on my site if I wanted to. But what they've been able to wrap around that is the value proposition to individual people. Okay. Um, if you do 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 start a company and you bring in staff, or actually even if you um, if you outsource, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the types of people in the technology industry. Um, I, I look at them as a lot of normal people and average people, but in, in the tech industry, you, you end up with sort of two sets of extremes. Um, and I'm going to give you a little bit of advice about how you deal with these people. Um, one are the cats. And the cats are very creative people. They get a lot of work done. Um, they, you know, they don't like rules. And you can get a lot of things out of these creative guys. The problem is they never like doing something twice. And if you guys are building a business, you have to have structure. You do have to have, you know, policies and procedures because in order to grow, I can't you can't just do one offs. If you're just doing one offs, then you're just selling you're just selling your time. But if you want to grow your business, you have to have rules and, and you actually have to have a little bit of um, a little bit of consistency there. So when you have these guys like herding cats where they want to go do whatever they want, you can you they're 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 great assets, but you have to you have to manage them right. So if you if you see one of those guys, you know, make sure you sit down with them, watch what they're doing. Um, make sure that they're act, you know, look at what, how they're actually doing it. A lot of times they'll go, it looks the same, but they'll go and develop it different ways. And then as your company gets bigger, um, your infrastructure isn't in, isn't in very good shape and, and they'll, you know, it might fall apart later. The other side of the coin are what I call the robots. And these are the guys that, they're sort of the lifer guys. Um, most of these guys are just repeat players. And they'll just do exactly what you, what you ask them to do, which is a great thing sometimes because if you need the guy, you can just say, here's what I want and just go do it. The problem is, if you don't get it right and you don't explain it to them right the first time, they're they're not going to interpolate. They're going to do exactly what you say, and it's your fault because you didn't tell them. Uh, these guys are good, you know, they're good resources too, but you, again, you have to know how to manage them. Um, you have to make sure that you keep bringing back to them the vision. What do you want to be? And the more you can show them what you want to be, the more that they can sort of develop and see the bigger picture, not just rules. Um, you do have to document things well, so you write down, uh, write down what you want, explain it in as much detail as possible, because they're not going to guess. If they do guess, they'll probably get it wrong. Um, and then you do have to check on them very frequently, because you need to. They're they're, they're going to go very very slowly, and if you don't check on it, um, if you don't check on it to make sure that they're building what you want, you'll get to the end of that whole process, and you'll it'll, they'll give you what you asked for, but not what you wanted there. Um, a little bit before what software businesses again are very flexible you're going to make a lot of twists and turns um, what were you guys what were you guys originally what was your product originally we were I forget um, <laughs> it was a way to it was more of a sales tool rather than a relationship tool yeah. to get in touch with right uh, I don't even remember but I, I do remember okay All right. you remember <laughs> yeah that's right So they started off with, um, you know, video resume, basically video college application. Then I think you thought about video resumes, and then yeah. you thought about um, a sales tool. And now you're sort of in a relationship management tool. That's how flexible these types of businesses are. You're never going to end up with where you started, right? But if you understand your core value, you're going to get somewhere, and you, you will find a good place for it. But while you're doing all of that, you still have to build a company on this development code. So you write, you got, yeah, you have people writing code. And they have a platform and a product that exists there, but you're going to change it over time. If you're not very, if you don't treat it like a business, you know, it's not just a hobby in a garage. If you treat it like a business where you keep everything clean and you have processes and procedures on how you do your development, if you don't do that, then in the long run, your product's going to fall apart. You're going to get to a point where, you know, a year or two in, you're not where you started, but the infrastructure underneath isn't going to support it. Um, usually, what happens then is you end up having to rewrite it, and that's a very, very large expense. Um, it costs a lot to redevelop everything, and you're probably not going to get it right exactly the second time. So when you put together this, make sure that you have documentation on what it's supposed to do, on how it's built. Um, have testing processes in place so that anything that's built is automatically tested every day so that anytime you change something, you know things don't break. So these are really these are best practices that are really considered um, core to the industry. Um, 
every team that I've ever been on has put this in place early on, and we've been able to be very flexible and change our product and change our direction very quickly. And we know that any changes we make are still safe because all these processes are in place and, and we know our product is, is still going to work. Um, so I said sort of one more comment, I think, on, on sort of the, the, the phenomenon of what people are calling Web 2.0. Mm -hmm. um, Web 2.0 is really the, the, the concept is about users are going to collaborate and share, and they're going to bring the content. You know, everyone uses Facebook or Twitter or YouTube um, or presentation. Um, and that's, that, that's see, a lot of people are chasing that right now. And from a business perspective, the real question is, where's the money in that? These, are, these, these companies are more like an entertainment industry, if you think about it. Right? People go to YouTube, it's for entertainment. They go to Facebook for entertainment. Um, the value proposition there is, is basically pure entertainment. Um, you guys, again, have done a, a really good job of taking that thing. How do we take this core concept um, but provide something that's more of a lasting value that's not really not going to be <coughs> subject to fad? Um, have you seen it? I guess you really haven't come across any mm -hmm. any sort of fad porn um, you know, with, your, with your content in terms of, you know, People go. People were MySpace. Now they're Facebook. Now they're somewhere else. But you got pretty much a sticky value proposition. What do you think? That's really what you think. I mean, we we think that there's a, a natural progression um, in in communication among professionals. I mean, their email is like they're they're kind of blasé and pedestrian now. People are looking for something that's going to stick out and be a little bit more effective. And um, what's great about ours is that it's it, it is something new. But then as more more people use it, it's it becomes equally effective. So. I mean, uh, w we see our product as the next step in line, as, as like a logical step in communication. So uh, hopefully it's not a fad. That would be terrible. <laughs> um, hopefully, you know, we, right. you know, we get past the fog before, you know, the fad passes. But I, mean, uh, I think just the, uh, <clears throat> the usage of Internet video hopefully is here to stay or we're in a lot of trouble. So we'll see. And in terms of the, uh, I guess, the sticking points, the big thing is, you know, you see a lot of Facebooks, you see a lot of YouTubes. As John said, these things are easy to build, but once you're in there, it's like we're trying to stay in the financial services industry, and once you're in there, it's very hard to get you out. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's the big thing is to capture the market yeah. first, because they're easy to build, but I guess it's, it's mm -hmm. who executes and who captures the market. Yeah, and if you look at it, if you go into a space like this, um, everybody was on – something before MySpace, and then everybody all of a sudden overnight left and went to MySpace, and everyone left MySpace and went to Facebook. So if you're going to put a business around it that you want, that you actually want to be able to, to, again, grow wealth for a long period of time, you have to find something that people are going to use that are, that's, that's sort of permanent. And that's, that's one of the reasons I, I like your ideas, because people are going to make this part of their business process. Once you're involved in someone's business process and it's successful, it's not, they're not going to change it. Of course, it also costs a lot to get in and to change someone's business process, but once you're in there, one of the things I like about eMoney, once we're part of somebody's uh, wealth management uh, platform and portfolio, they're not going to leave us. So it's very, very sticky. won't say rece recession-proof, but um, you know, in, in this type of market, people are still going to keep their client happy, so they're going to use ours. So you know, if, um, you know, client, if, if one of the advisors or financial advisors are using that to communicate to the client, they're, they're going to they're keep that up. They're never going to they're not going to give that up. So if you're going to put a business plan together um, around that, you know, try to find some way that it's sticky and it's not just a fad. Unless you just want to be an entertainment company, and then you can go and, and chase something like that. Um, if you do have an idea um, to get that you want to get started, um, I think this is a great forum. There's a lot of resources that are available today. Um, it's very very easy to, to to start off and and sketch an idea. Uh, I don't know what your what, what it, how does your start off because I've seen I've seen actually seen designs on on a paper plate that's a lot a lot of our product ideas come out um, napkins things like that um, I think I don't know did, did you ever tell me that story I guess ours we just like I said before we kind of just drew it in Word and yeah. we just kind of jumped in and I guess that's really the only advice I can give any young students here is just to I mean as it says here you just you can make a prototype, but we thought about making a prototype, but then we just said, why not th just do it all? And I guess our big proposition was just the fact that, you know, you can put thousands of dollars into something, but it's just money. And if you do it, I mean, it looks great on your resume. Even if your company fails, your starting salary is going to go up more than the, what you invested. So there's really no downside to doing it, but that's what we did. We just kind of jumped in. I met 
costume and just said probably like a week turnaround. Um, just and all you need is just like you said a paper plate, anything like that. Find someone good who's good with technology, and if you can get the funds, then you're good to go. So that's how we did it. Yeah, this is the kind of the part of the story where I always talk about how Jake completely took advantage of a situation I was in to get me involved. I was actually studying abroad at the time, and we would talk about this via Skype um, while I was in, in Europe. And you know, being five hours ahead, I would come home from the pub and talking to this kid who I just met about starting some business, and, and here I am. So it's very interesting in taking that initial step. I probably wouldn't have done it in another situation, but I couldn't be more happy. And um, you know, in regards to you know building the prototype and, and designing the product, if you find someone who's equally passionate about it and much more knowledgeable, like Kasim and his team, it's it, 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 it's I'm not going to say it's easy, but it's much more enjoyable. I always kind of joke around saying that they've been able to solve any problem that we've presented them with. I'm just going to send them an email one day telling them I'd like to to time travel, and I'm pretty sure it'll happen the next week just because <laughs> uh, they've been that amazing. So, yeah, uh, just just go for it, I guess. And that's actually you brought up a good point there. When you're communicating, you know, if you're a business person, you're communicating with a technology team. I do recommend rather than saying give me X, tell them what problem you're trying to solve. Because because you, you, if you're working with a smart team, they'll find a better solution than you probably came up, you probably originally thought of, and you'll be able to bounce around. And a lot of people fall in this trap and say, you know, I want a widget, and you know, half the time I'll tell them, why the hell would you want that? You know, you're trying to do time travel. Widget's not going to help you. Why don't we get, you know, why don't we, why don't we come up with something? And that interaction between between you and the rest of the members of your team is much more valuable than working in, in, in isolation. It's probably one of the biggest uh, best advice I can give you. So we wanted to save some time. I, I know there's, there's uh, we're probably the most technology focused section here. And there's a lot of entrepreneur and business sessions. So if you want to talk, you know, ask more questions uh, focused around that, I think we, you know, we can. There's a lot of time for that. Go ahead. I think the question is, um, you know, how, how did you come up with that first pitch? Yeah, right. Yeah. You probably had the more direct experience, so will you go yeah. first? How did we formulate the first pitch? Um, so how did we get to market? Or or just how did you get it out of your brain, yeah. down on paper, and then like start talking about it? Like, really, like, I guess I guess the biggest thing was uh, Dr. Klingler up there, um, just running this whole thing. He was our advisor from the very beginning. Um, and really, we just ran every idea by him, and he would just spit out the right answer like every <laughs> single time. So it, <laughs> their, their right, solution so is to get someone else to do all the yeah, work. So yeah. So same with same with Cosm. So I think that it like Cosm, we would, I mean, we don't know how to program software. We'd say we want this done, as John said. We put that vision, and they'd be able to translate it. So I guess what I'm saying is that you just have to find people are willing to help you if you just ask them. So I mean, it's just it's finding and then. I mean, that's even how we got to market. We presented to uh, Dean Danko, and he connected us with an alumni who happens to be Edmund Walters, who's the CEO of eMoney. So, I mean, it's just talking to people that are smarter than you and just listening to what they say. Like Networking is very important. Uh, I highly recommend everyone, uh, if you're in the technology space or uh, in the software space, to get a whiteboard. You know, you can get them for home, you know, small ones or whatever, because it's better, you know, you can just draw stuff on and erase it. If you're, if you're sitting down and you're explaining something to someone, it's great to have a diagram. Again, a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, I've actually met someone who didn't know how to stand at a whiteboard to draw anything once, and it was almost impossible to have a conversation with her because she, she couldn't explain with her hands 
I said, draw it on the board. She couldn't draw it on the board. And I d didn't realize how dependent I am in terms of expressing ideas with pictures. So I actually have some friends that bought whiteboards and they practice. Mm -hmm. That's what that book we just used all about. Yeah. 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 Yeah
the home office doesn't keep track of things. They like the status quo. So between a brand and sort of you know getting in there and covering the ground um, with a lot of these professional products, you know that that those are very good ways to stay ahead of the curve. So the question is, when do you think your product is ready to sell? Um, my thoughts on that is you can sell to anybody at any time. If they don't buy it, they don't buy it. You'll, you can come back. Um, we really didn't see – I don't think we really saw a setback. I don't know about you guys in, in, in your experience, but we didn't – anyone we sold to the, the first time, we didn't have enough features. They said, looks great, I'd love it, but I just need X. And then we'd come back next year with X. And then they wanted something else, which was <laughs> – a different problem, but there was never any any tarnish about that. So, I would say sell as fast as you can as soon as you have something that somebody can use. Um, I, I know you guys are going through that right now. I would say sell it even before you have anything. Actually, <laughs> yeah. just, you're right. Yeah. I, I would just. I, I mean, I speak with a lot of executives at E Money, and, and they told me at the beginning it was it was nothing. It was an idea, and they and they they bought into the idea. It was, they said smoke and mirrors, but I don't believe that. There was a, a legitimate idea there, and our product didn't even really work before we started selling it. I specifically remember presenting here last year, and it was probably the most terrible presentation I ever gave because the product didn't work at all. But we already had paying customers at the time because they bought into the idea, and you know we just continue to reiter reiterate our mantra of professional Internet video, and if there's a need for it, people will give you money for it no matter what. And, so. and you'll learn from those initial sales. Even while you're in the development process and you're doing pre-sales and you're showing off prototypes, they might, people might not give you cash on a sales call, but they'll give you a lot of good information. And because it's software, if you build it and you wait to show it to someone until you're done, it might be wrong. But if you get halfway through and you say, hey, here's what it's going to be, it'll be out uh, next week, even though it's really six weeks or a month from now, you'll get that feedback and say, oh, I just need X. You'll have time to make those changes. So the more feedback you can get, the earlier you can get, even if it's not real yet. question is, is the, is the economy affecting sales? And I would probably say yes. Um, but now, uh, from the people that I've talked to in the VC world and the funding world, it's a lot harder to get cash to get started. Um, this is probably one of your direct questions because nobody here has a product yet. Um, it is a lot harder to get started. So um, for the guys that actually can build it themselves, you might have an advantage because your time can be instantly converted to value rather than raising money. Um, in terms of sales barriers, um, see, we're in the financial wealth management space, so I, I don't see it right now because when people panic, they call their advisor, so we're, we're in pretty good shape. But um, I have seen a lot of people um, being cut back on sales, and, um, and it has been a little bit more difficult, yeah.
Backstage and backstage. Um, when you're talking to your friends, you can be backstage. You can be as casual as you want. You can pitch it around. No, nobody cares what you say, how many mistakes you make. When you're going in front of a potential client or an investor, etc., you're in front of the stage. Make sure you have your script. Make sure you know what you're talking about. It doesn't have to be. You don't have to have all the answers, but make sure that it that you know you look like you know what you're doing. And these guys do a great job with that. And when you they go do presentations to customers. They have their pitch. They come into my office and they're like, "I don't know what I'm doing." So <laughs> that's that's very very important. But again, do it as much as possible, and you can do, you know go out, do your script, learn from what you can, go back, rehearse it again, and go do something else. I'm afraid we're out of time. I know this session could go on a long time. Thank you very much. Well done, guys. Thank you. Well Thank done. You. All right. Who's got the front row? My parents. I'll sit in the new shoe. Oh, really? Yeah.